This 14 core processor is pretty good. A bit expensive, but overall it's a beast. Before we get into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to hit the like button and subscribe so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Additionally, don't forget to leave a comment, especially if there's something you think I missed. I can't cover every aspect of a processor in the relatively short duration of a video, but I more so wanted to discuss some benchmarks, then dive into the specifications to further dissect its performance. Without anything else to say, let's dive into the i5-13600K and see how this chip performs in games. To test the 13600K, I've got a second-hand Gigabyte Z690 RS Pro DDR4. This board, while it isn't anything super special when it comes to its design, features a 16 plus 1 phase VRM setup for the core and an additional 2 phase for auxiliary power. This should allow the 13600K to reach its maximum potential through removing power limitations from the VRM. We've also got a Corsair H150i 360mm AIO to fulfill cooling duties, so we should be good in terms of heat dissipation and power delivery. This allowed the 13600K to clock to a stable 5.4GHz on all 6 of the P cores, and a flat 4GHz on all 8 of the E cores. This is pretty fast, especially for the P cores, and surprisingly there wasn't a ton of extra heat like I would expect. Paired with the processor, we've also got 32 gigs of Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 at 3600 megatransfers per second, which should help to reduce memory bottlenecks as this isn't a DDR5 board, since I currently don't have supported memory. 32 gigabytes is also plenty to prevent the system from having to resort to reading from secondary storage, so we shouldn't run into memory related issues or stuttering caused by streaming in data. To store games, the system has a Western Digital Black SN771 TB, a PCIe 4 drive capable of just over 5GB per second of sequential reads and just under that for sequential writes. It'll help to reduce load times primarily, but should also help to reduce stutter should the system overflow its memory. To provide a comparison point, I decided to include my i7-11700K as well, since it was the most powerful processor I had previously owned. It's clocked to 5 GHz in this test, so it should provide a decent competitor to the newer and differently equipped i5. Both setups are equipped with an RTX 3070 Ti and are being tested at 1080p with the lowest settings, and DLSS if it's available to help reduce the GPU load. Without anything else to cover, let's dive into some benchmarks and see how the 13600K performs. As is tradition on this channel, the first game I fired up was Apex Legends, and compared to the two generation old 11700K, the gains on average weren't anything to write home about. However, the 1% lows improved by about 11 FPS when moving up to the 13600K, bringing it up to 120 which is beyond playable. Even though we're testing at 1080p, this means the i5 is capable of pushing frames more consistently, probably thanks to its stronger single threaded performance on the P cores. The average FPS on the 13600K was also brought up to 144, up 3 FPS from the 11700K's 141, which like I mentioned isn't all that much. Realistically you probably wouldn't be able to tell a difference between the two chips if you were just told to play games on them with the same setup, but for the ultra competitive gamers out there, the improved performance on the lower end of things may help give a more consistently competitive experience. Up next are two Frostbite Engine games, but I'm going to kind of gloss over the second one because performance was almost identical thanks to engine frame rate limits. However, Battlefield 2042 showed some scaling at all the measured data points, improving by roughly 13% on average when moving from the 11700K to the 13600K. The average on the i5 was 285, and the 1% low came in at 162 FPS, both of which are high refresh rate capable and it seems as if this chip is able to power through the game despite the notoriously heavy CPU load. I wouldn't consider the 11700K to be unplayable, but the 13600K is just an outright stronger choice when it comes to this Battlefield game, though I can't say the same about its prior gen predecessor, Battlefield 1. Both these chips returned identical performance, probably due to the game featuring an engine frame rate limit of 200 FPS. Looking at it now, I do think it's strange that the 1% low values matched between the two chips, 
but I'd be willing to bet that this occurs similarly to what happens in GTA 5 once you hit 188 FPS. Realistically speaking though, if you wanted to get a better value chip to get into older or newer Battlefield titles, then the i5-11400 and 12400 would offer nearly identical performance to both these new chips at a much easier to swallow price point. I think that while it is cool to run at absurd frame rates, the engine bottleneck kind of limits the conclusions we can draw. Borderlands 3, our first Unreal Engine 4 title, showed barely any scaling when it came to average performance, but saw a massive improvement to 1% lows. This may not seem super significant, but what this means is that the game was performing better in its worst areas. These performance dips are what can kind of kill a good session, and in all reality are what make you want to upgrade parts of your system anyways. I'm not saying that the game is unplayable on the 11700K, the 13600K just surpasses it because of the smoother 186 FPS 1% low, despite only gaining 2 FPS on average. The maximum for the i5 also came in at 308 which compared to the 275 FPS maximum on the 11700K is a solid 12% increase and not something I'd complain about. Overall though, if you're wanting to get into some Borderlands, then either of these chips would give you a great time, and when looking at the numbers, the 13600K does edge out a small victory. Our next game is soon to be outdated, but in its current form it's still a great benchmark to test single-threaded CPU capabilities. Because CSGO is written using the older and more fragmented DirectX 9 API, it's just less efficient at taking advantage of newer hardware or design concepts. At the test settings and resolution, the 13600K returned an average and 1% low of 371 and 158 FPS respectively. Meanwhile, the 11700K scored an average and 1% low of 340 and 97 FPS. The average performance is a notable improvement over the 11th gen parts, but when it comes to real-world gaming scenarios, an extra 30 FPS when you're running at over 300 isn't going to make a huge difference. Unless you're me and you just want to see number go up, it's probably not worth picking up a 13th gen chip and accompanying motherboard if you're still on a Skylake or Cypress Cove based system. As the performance uplift, while it is there, it's hard to justify once you get to this class of hardware. One area where the 13600K manages to improve more significantly was the 1% lows. Increasing from 97 to 158 shows how helpful stronger individual cores are when running this game. Once again though, would you notice the improved 1% lows? Well, you actually probably could if you have a high refresh rate monitor. But realistically, unless you've got spidey senses, you probably won't notice much of a difference going between the two chips. Going with whichever platform is cheaper is probably the smarter option in CSGO if you're looking to play casually. But for competitive gamers, the Raptor Lake parts provide a nice bump that, while not revolutionary, is 100% welcome. Up next is this generation's Crisis, and as such, it lives up to its name. Cyberbug 2077, the open-world cyberpunk dystopia game from CD Projekt Red, didn't perform much differently between the two chips because we're so heavily GPU bottlenecked. While the 1% lows and average didn't improve all that much going from the 11700K to the 13600K, the maximum frame rate improved by 21 FPS, which is measurable. However, the average of 204 on the 13600K and the 201 FPS average on the 11700K paint a picture of similar high refresh rate performance. Unfortunately though, in order to see the full power of these chips, you'd need a GPU stronger than a 3070 Ti. Cyberpunk just runs kind of poorly even on most modern hardware, though I think a conclusion we can draw would be that either chip is overkill for most cyberpunk focused systems and you'd instead more likely be limited by the performance of your GPU. Kind of a boring takeaway, but based on the data collected, they perform pretty similarly, albeit it's not because they're equivalently performant. Our first Unreal Engine 5 title, Fortnite, saw performance scaling going from the 11700K to the 13600K similar to what CSGO exhibited. While the 13600K returned an average and 1% low of 364 and 165 FPS respectively, the 13600K is hot on its heels with an average and 1% low coming in at 347 and 112 FPS. The 13600K is an improvement, especially when it comes to the maximum performance achieved, to the point where it's sort of worth considering this chip over older, less expensive options as the consistency of your frame rate will improve as the GPU load increases. This isn't to say that the 11700K is unplayable, but if you're investing in the platform in 2023, 
then LGA 1700 might offer a stronger upgrade path, albeit at a higher price. When you're GPU bound though, like you realistically would be in most gaming scenarios, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two chips, as their performance only really starts to diverge at lower resolutions. Fortnite's art style also lends a helping hand to the low settings, as nothing looks bad per se, and it doesn't appear immediately obvious that I'm rocking at the lowest graphic settings. That being said, I do like the ray tracing implementation in this game, and enabling it would increase the CPU load even further. This would also allow the 13600K to excel theoretically, but in real world performance we're so GPU bottlenecked that performance basically looks identical. At competitive settings, this game runs well on the hardware tested, and it's an easy recommendation for either chip if you're looking to get an ultra-competitive Fortnite experience. Minecraft Java Edition, in this case version 1.19.4, is a game written on a custom OpenGL-based renderer, and at 1080p with low graphical effects and the render distance set to 32 chunks, the 13600K provided a nice jump in the maximum and 1% low performance figures over the older 11700K. With the 13600K achieving a 1% low of 46 and an average of 400, it's hard to call this game anything other than playable, though there is some stutter that's present and is present no matter what hardware you're running on. However, the raw IPC and frequency gains of Raptor Cove allow this chip to provide a higher level of performance, especially since Java applications are so single thread dependent. I wouldn't say that Skylake chips can't run Minecraft well, but these chips with stronger single-threaded performance allow them to outcompete them in terms of actually playing the game. Part of me also wonders how this chip would perform as a Minecraft server, but that's something to explore at a different time. Either way, like most of the other games I've tested up until this point, performance between the two chips is very playable, and it's hard to argue that one is objectively inferior or superior to the other. They're just different. But just because I say that doesn't mean that the 13600K doesn't provide some performance jump because it certainly does. The game still stutters, but they last for less time and occur less frequently. Overall, Minecraft runs well on the 13600K, though the 11700K provides most of the performance at a cheaper price. Up next is the merged Modern Warfare 2 and Warzone 2.0 benchmark, as the games perform basically the same plus or minus a few frames. Digging into performance, and this game is one of the stronger showings of the 13600K, in comparison to its older gen sibling. With an average and 1% low of 188 on 131 FPS, the i5 provides a solid 22% improvement over the i7, and if you're an ultra competitive gamer, this may actually matter to you. Performance becomes high refresh rate locked if you're targeting 120 Hz, and if you've got a more powerful GPU, then this chip definitely has the power to push high refresh rates at higher resolutions. The less expensive i5-12400 would also provide much of the performance of the 13600K, and would spank down the 11700K at almost half the price. Just reiterating, this chip provides a decent uplift in performance roughly in line with the claimed IPC uplift brought on by the new P-Corp microarchitecture, and the higher clocks seem to put the cherry on top when it comes to allowing these chips to have higher throughput to drive lower latencies. The next games we'll be taking a look at are built on Rockstar's Rage Engine, but despite the same base tech, they perform very differently. Red Dead Redemption 2, the most recent game on this engine, performed very well on the 13600K, and saw performance scale up with the new microarchitecture. With an average and 1% low of 201 and 123 FPS, the 13600K pulls ahead of the 11700K by about 22% on average, and just under 17% on the 1% lows indicating that the game felt not only smoother to play overall, but was overall smoother in areas that needed the extra performance. The fact that this game was written on Vulkan probably helps with CPU overhead, allowing the chips we're testing today to avoid the same fate as the next game, Grand Theft Auto V. While this is by far the most popular Rage title, the performance was by far the worst we've experienced up until this point due to its weird stuttering issue once a certain frame rate has been achieved. As a result, the game performed basically identically between the two chips because it was a stuttery mess. I usually can ignore a little bit of stutter here and there, but these were huge game-pausing stutters that would literally make your car uncontrollable and you'd spin out. If you want to get into GTA for the least amount of money, then the 11700K would basically provide the same performance as the 13600K because if you want a decent experience, or really any experience at all, a frame cap will be necessary. It's unfortunate, but might be a sign that GTA is becoming a bit dated in the performance benchmarking scene. 
Either way, once a frame cap is introduced, the game basically locks to it, so 144 or 120Hz gaming is 100% possible on either of these chips at this resolution. The last game we'll be taking a look at in this video is Sons of the Forest, and at 1080p in the settings we're testing at, the 13600K saw a nice roughly 9% lead over the 11700K. While the average of 158 FPS might not seem like a huge improvement, the 1% low of 101 on the i5 and 66 on the i7 show that's where a lot of the performance seems to be going, and I'd be willing to bet that the performance gap would widen a bit with a more powerful GPU. Interestingly, the maximum frame rate dipped down to 195 on the i5, down from the 212 achieved on the 11700K, and that could be caused by a GPU bottleneck or some other random event that occurred in the world. I made sure I spawned in the same spot between both runs, and I tried to follow similar paths, but it seems like there was some variance. Either way, both these chips would be powerful enough to drive a high refresh rate targeted build, with the i5 providing a nice improvement in the 1% lows. The game felt great to play, but if given the opportunity, I'd like to retest this with a more powerful GPU. Now that we've got the benchmarks out of the way, why does the chip perform this way? Because the general trend seems to be that the 13th Gen i5 beats the 11th Gen i7 in most workloads, especially those requiring raw threads. However, because the performance on the i7 was already super playable, the extra single-threaded performance added on top by the 13600K doesn't seem to be all that game-changing, especially if you're upgrading from set 11th or 12th gen parts. Well, it's actually an interesting story, and what I think is important to focus on is the width of the pipelines on die combined with the supporting caches and controllers. The die featured in this processor, while it is cut down, is a little different from the previous 12th gen parts. Just looking at the full Raptor like S die, you can see that it's now physically longer than its 12th gen counterpart, due to an additional 8 efficiency cores being added. This brings the total number of cores in a fully unlocked i9-13900K to 24, and while this particular chip doesn't sport that many cores, this increase in core count trickles down to the i5 line as well. While the last generation sported a 10-core 16-threaded i5-12600K, Raptor Lake now sports a 14-core and 20-threaded i5-13600K. The amount of performance cores remains the same between the two chips, but the 13th gen part sports 4 additional efficiency cores, which while technically the same as 12th gen's Gracemont cores, have been beefed up with extra cash. The 6 performance cores have also been juiced a bit with an extra 768 kilobytes of private L2 cache per core, increasing it to 2 megabytes from Alder Lake's 1.25 megabytes. The chip also has a total of 24 megabytes of level 3 cache, all of which can be accessed by any particular core. Compared to the prior gen's 20 megs of cache, the extra 4 megs probably comes in handy when it comes to feeding the extra e-core cluster, and also helps to maintain overall core IPC and low latency. This additional cache is also there, at least from what I understand, to improve performance at the new higher clock speeds. The 13600K has two different types of cores that exhibit two different clocking characteristics. The large performance, or P cores, are clocked at 3.5 GHz all-core base and 5.1 GHz single-core turbo. Out of the box though, all the P cores clocked to 5.1 GHz and were basically locked there when gaming. Though because this is an unlocked K-series chip, overclocking is fully supported, and for my preliminary tests, the P cores are hitting a hardware-stable 5.5 GHz all-core. But there seems to be some in-software instability that goes away when I lower everything to 5.4 GHz. Kind of weird, but at the end of the day, 5.4 GHz is still redonkulously fast, and it's hard to say that it's not impressive what's been achieved here. The voltage is also only at 1.25 volts, which is literally black magic. Whatever Intel is doing to their updated 7 Ultra process has pushed the higher end of the voltage frequency curve to the left, meaning that for any particular voltage, the core is able to clock faster than it was before. For example, the voltage frequency curve for Skylake parts, or 6th through 10th gen, were basically identical no matter which part you had, and from my experience could hit 5 GHz at around 1.3 volts depending on the silicon lottery. The 11th gen parts needed a bit more voltage to hit the same clock speeds, which is fine as it was also a 14 nanometer chip, but as a result they draw more power. Alder Lake parts seem to behave similarly to Skylake in terms of voltages required, but Raptor Lake is way more than just quote, better bidding. Sure, you may win the silicon lottery and get a decent quality chip that will allow you to reduce voltages a little further than what I'm discussing here, 
but it's nowhere near what they achieved going from Alder Lake to Raptor Lake in their 7 Ultra process. To give you an idea as to how impressive this is, keep in mind that the prior gen's i9-12900KS could barely hit 5.5GHz due to power and thermal constraints. Now this i5 is hitting it with no problem, albeit with some slight quirkiness. The efficiency cores though don't clock as high and don't have as much overclocking headroom. With 2.6GHz base and 3.9GHz all-core turbo, I was able to get the clocks up to 4.1GHz at the same voltage as the P cores, which isn't really all that bad considering Intel claims a Gracemont core is equivalent in performance to a Skylake thread. It's theoretically like having a 6700K to do background tasks and handle the OS, while the six performance cores can handle gaming or driving photo or video editing. These cores are more meant to support the performance cores, or take a portion of the load off of them. For single-threaded tasks like gaming, they don't perform all that great, but for multi-threaded tasks like video editing or code compilation, they provide extra horsepower when parallelizable tasks are encountered. I heard someone once describe this as a multi-threading cheat code, and for all intents and purposes, it is. But at the same time, they are real cores that can do real work. And since you've got a homogeneous ISA between them, you don't have to worry about one type not supporting instructions while the other does. At least in theory. Alder Lake parts manufactured before January 2022 actually feature AVX512 vector units that can be turned on when the E-cores are turned off. You can tell this by the little Intel circle on the left-hand side above the processor's markings. If the chip has a square there instead, then the AVX512 is fused off, and doesn't work unfortunately. For programmers looking to take advantage of this instruction set, it's kind of disappointing how Intel would include it for a generation or two, then take it away. But I do understand that this is just a concession they had to make to get this heterogeneous architecture working. Speaking of heterogeneous, while some might argue that this shouldn't be called a 14-core chip, it does feature 14 individual structures that all contain the necessary circuitry to operate independently of one another and perform calculations or operations typically run on a CPU. The ISA is the same, so they're all equally capable of the same mathematical and memory manipulation functions. But the microarchitecture, or the structure supporting the ALUs, is what differs between the two core types. Unlike other high core count processors, like AMD's FX8350, each of these Raptor Cove cores and Gracemont cores have their own independent resources such as FPUs, caches, and then the E-core cluster share ring interconnects. This allows Intel to actually operate on data and execute instructions in a truly parallel fashion, despite not all the cores being identical in structure. This approach is more efficient in terms of power in silicon area, as you're able to fit roughly four E cores within the footprint of a single P core. This means that you get larger cores designed for low latency, high single threaded throughput, but at the cost of higher power consumption, along with smaller cores designed to handle parallelizable workloads, or just provide some extra grunt if the performance cores get swamped, all while running at lower clock speeds to save power. I'm interested in making a video on how the E cores perform in games, so let me know if you're interested in it as well, because I have a feeling the story is going to be more interesting than simply don't use them. But generally speaking, when you're gaming, the E-cores aren't actually going to be what's running your game. They're more likely running background tasks like the Discord window you've got open or the YouTube tab playing this video. This, in theory and when done properly, frees up additional cycles on the performance cores, giving you that slight extra bump in software utilizing a single-threaded execution path. Within the cores, you've also got substructures called execution ports, which, as the name suggests, actually execute the instructions being fed into the core. The Raptor Cove P cores feature 12 execution ports, comprising 5 ALUs, 2 FPUs, 2 branch shifts, and the rest being load stores. Meanwhile, the Gracemont E cores feature 17 execution ports, though they aren't all as capable or as wide as the ports found in the P cores. The ports break down into what appear to be five regular ALUs, an AVX ALU, an FPU, and then load stores. Additionally, the P cores actually feature less per core L1 cache with only 80 kilobytes. Meanwhile, the E cores rock 96 kilobytes. The L2 cache is a bit more complicated though because the P cores have independent or private L2 caches of two megabytes. Meanwhile, the E cores are grouped together into quad core clusters and each of these clusters has 4 megs of L2 cache that's private to the associated cluster. This means that the per-core distribution of cache leans in favor of the P-cores, but the localized and shared nature of the cache in the E-cores provides more opportunity for data reuse or sharing. 
Power is another topic that's rather important because it ultimately determines cooling and motherboard VRM requirements. Stock, this chip has a PL2 of 189 watts and a PL1 of 125 watts. Because this is a K-series chip, it'll maintain the PL2 power limit as long as cooling allows, but you can ultimately override this in the BIOS if you wanted to. Out of the box, the chip is actually pretty efficient, especially when compared to my last chip, the 11700K. In-game, power hangs out between 40 to 70 watts depending on what I'm playing, but in most games it hangs out at or below the 60 watt mark. Under load, like when in Blender or compiling programs or maps, the chip draws at most 105 watts at the stock 5.1 and 3.9 GHz turbo values, and this went up to only 172 watts at 5.5 and 4.1 GHz. It definitely draws more power than AMD's competing AM5 socket 6 core offerings, but for the power, you get more cache, stronger single threaded performance, and 8 additional cores, that while weaker are still cores and can do calculations or memory manipulations. The cores themselves are powerful, but with a weak memory system they wouldn't be able to keep themselves fed, and would thus lose a lot of performance. The DDR controller in the Raptor like SDI is actually pretty interesting, because it builds off a lot of the concepts introduced in the 11th gen parts, and then further implemented in 12th gen. Unlike AMD's Integrated Memory Controller, or IMC, Intel sports DDR4 and DDR5 compatibility, but at different speeds. Ultimately, this chip sports DDR4-3200 and Gear 1, which is basically identical to what 11th and 12th gen supported. However, 13th gen parts get official DDR5-5600 support, bringing the total maximum theoretical bandwidth to just over 83 gigabytes per second. However, the latencies that are supported still aren't super tight, meaning that the latencies going from DDR4 to 5 are basically identical, at least for now. In a few years when DDR5 matures a bit more, speeds will come up and you'll be able to use XMP, but for now only two DIMMs are really supported. It's kind of disappointing, but like I said, once DDR5 catches up, things will improve, as will motherboards. For now though, DDR4 provides the best value when it comes to putting together a build. And considering you can find 32 gigs of DDR4 for pretty cheap, it still isn't super affordable to make the jump to DDR5. So, thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Let me know what you guys think about the 13600K or any of the other processors discussed in this video. It's definitely a beast, but it's kind of hard to recommend when there are so many other great budget options. That's all I really have to say on the matter, so thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.